first one of these days. I'm just warming up to it. Where are they anyway? Aren't you supposed to start at 5.30? Yeah, but I don't know. Students. Oh, wait a minute! Hey, if you're not going to come, you don't need so much. Okay. See you next time. Trick yeah, I know, unfortunately. <laughs> Trick or treat for UNICEF. Okay, I guess we can start now. Or have you been running? <laughs> All right, so um, path integrals are basically ways of using Gaussian integration to give us formulas for either the time evolution operator or the main operator of statistical physics, e to the minus beta h, beta being. 1 over k t. And if you start a complete set of states here, you see that this turns into a projection operator on the ground state of the theory. And um, so for theories like QCD, where, that is to say, quantum chromodynamics, the theory of strong interactions, where you can't do perturbation theory, then um, this is a way of get this projection operator is a way of getting at the vacuum, which is uh, a very complicated object and strongly interacting field theories like PCD. Okay, well, Gaussian integrals. Um, let's just realize that one can use complex variable theory. Unfortunately, I use Z, not the integration variable, but for. No bro forever. I'm sorry about yawning. I don't know what it is. I think it's this damned election that was so uh, uh, frustrating. Uh, so awfully frustrating, but it was also um, I kept getting phone calls uh, at odd hours, and um, one of them was actually from Jeff Bingham. It was a wrong number. 
I thought I was Paul somebody. <laughs> I told him I wrote a straight Democratic ticket. <laughs> Okay, so um, if you expand this, what you see is this is e to the minus z squared x squared um, minus 2bx dx is equal to square root of pi over z e to the z squared over b squared. No, z squared, b squared, what am I saying? Okay, and this works as long as um, the real part of z squared is greater than or equal to zero and uh, z is not identically zero. So you get then this, uh, the use of this integral. B is essentially a material. And, um, okay, so that's basically the Gaussian integral that one wants to use. And, um, in fact, a slightly different form of it is e to the minus z squared x squared plus cx dx equals square root of pi over z e to the c squared over 2z squared. So that's another form of this Gaussian form. And, um, well, one can play with this. Uh, one can consider a product of these integrals. So um, a product, uh, say, or uh, maybe I should just say an integral of um, E, and now if I just use the summation convention, ZI squared XI squared plus CI XI product DXI, this whole thing turns into a product I equals one to <coughs> capital N here of square root of pi over ZI E to the CI squared over 2CI squared. Okay, so there's a fairly general Gaussian integral, and that's just a mistake. And now um, one can rewrite this in various ways. You can say that um, Z is a diagonal matrix um, with entries Z1, Zn, um, and um, x is a vector, x1 down to xn, c is a vector, c1, cn. And now this thing can be rewritten in matrix notation and it's integral e to the minus x transpose z squared x plus c transpose x and then product of all the dx's equals 1 over the determinant of z over the square root of pi e to the 1 quarter c transpose to z to the minus 2 c we're doing Gaussian integrals. Um, so, any real um, symmetric matrix S can be written as O, Z, O transpose. And um, if you do that, then what you find is the integral E to the minus x transpose o transpose s squared o x plus c transpose o transpose o x product of all the dx's is again 1 over determinant s over root pi and then 
C is a one quarter, C transpose O transpose S to the minus two O C. Okay. Um, well, one more step if you let Y equal O X and uh, E equal O C, then what you get is integral E to the minus Y transpose S squared Y plus C transpose Y. Now the dy's, and the transformation from the x's to the y's is orthogonal, so the Jacobian is 1. So this is just the product of the dy's, and this is 1 over determinant s over root pi. And now this is e to the 1 quarter d transpose s to the minus 2d. Okay, well this, this is the formula that you can use to do basically the Gaussian. Well, it's, it's, it'll turn out to be the workhorse of perturbation theory for functional integrals involving bosonic fields. Is there a question? Z is diagonal? Z started out diagonal. Okay. Yes. okay. <clears throat> but then we switched from Z to an arbitrary symmetric matrix. <laughs> okay. Are people freezing in here? I notice that you're huddled in your coat. Uh, he's just me. <laughs> I'm feeling good. Everybody's all right? Yeah. Okay. One example of a very simple in, uh, Gaussian integral, just let me. I'm, I'm sort of, I realize I'm sort of boring some of your debt. This is a uh, square root of pi over pi. So, all right, so, so much for all that. Now let's get to actually the uh, idea of path integrals. There are, there's some lingo associated with this. Um, it's, it's even confusing lingo. Um, this one is said to be, when, you, when you're trying to evaluate this integral, it's said to be a path integral for imaginary time. If you're doing this one, it's said to be a path integral for real time. And of course, this is confusing. In fact, I had to check by looking at the, my own notes uh, that this one was the real time because the real time has the <laughs> I in it and the imaginary time doesn't. So it's, it's kind of, you got to keep track of the lingo, which is kind of silly. Um, Wait, I thought that was, you're saying beta is 1 over kt? Yeah. And this is, is what that, one. Is that like beta is thought of as a time. Are you calling it it though? Or are you just substituting Yeah, it? when it's thinking of, I mean, you just here, say you, let, you let t equal minus i beta. And then this one goes into that. And um, when this was first appreciated, I don't know, back in, the, I suppose, about 60 years ago, or 50 or 60 years ago, um, this, this was what's the novel. Meaning, but, um, what's the meaning of temperature then in that case? Excuse me? What do, what do you mean by temperature then in that case? Temperature. What is the meaning of the temperature? What is the meaning of temperature? I mean, for beta. Beta is 1 over kT. K is the Boltzmann constant. T is the temperature. Oh, okay. So in other words, if you're doing, I mean, there are two possibilities. You could be doing stat mech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then temperature is temperature. Yeah, yeah, that I believe. Or <laughs> what you can be doing is you can be saying, well, um, I'm really not interested in stat mech. I'm trying to get the ground state of this particular theory. Oh. Then you take this operator and you send beta to infinity. Oh, okay. And that then gives you a projection operator on the ground state of the theory. So why does that term survive? How come it's not also going to zero? 
Um, good point, and I, um, I think that, that to, be, to be truthful, what you have to do, what, what you have to do is think about a, a you put, don't you put a, a ground state at zero and then everything else is not zero? The, 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 yeah, what's in the And that way that you have e to the zero as well. In other words, if you know what the ground state energy is, <coughs> then you multiply this by e to the beta e zero and take the limit of beta going to infinity. That's one way of doing it. Okay, sure. If you don't know what the ground state energy is, then what you would do was you use the functional integral to compute this thing. And what you do is you compute the following. You compute a ratio of some operator, uh, let's call it Q, in this state E0. And you divide that by E0, E0. And this one, you see, if you wrote this then as e to the minus beta h, and this one as q e to the minus beta h, and then you say took the trace of both of them, and then you take the limit beta going to infinity, um, this would project out the ground state. Oh, it's a trace. Okay, not an H part. <laughs> Got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Meanwhile, um, let's do an example of a uh, simple case. P squared over 2m plus V of Q. So this is, and I'm going to be doing it for the case of so-called imaginary time. In other words, we're doing stat mech of a single quantum particle, single quantum degree of freedom with an arbitrary potential and a quadratic p squared. The quadratic p squared, it turns out, is important because um, you basically want Gaussian integrals. And um, all right, so let's, let's get on with this. Now, here's the uh, big approximation that we make, we say e to the minus um, epsilon times h, which is to say e to the minus epsilon times p squared over 2m plus v, v being v of q here. This is approximately e to the minus epsilon p squared over 2m times e to the minus epsilon v <coughs> plus, of course, order epsilon squared terms. Right? And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using this expression, this approximation for that in the limit where epsilon is very, very small. And we're going to be using this over and over again for many factors and um, so does the so if we were to use the Baker Baker Campbell Hausdorff theorem to get the phase that would have an epsilon squared yeah and so that's why we're neglecting it yeah okay and um, there's another theorem called the Trotter product formula that I was thinking of using but I suppressed the urge. Um, By the way, this I'm following here, chapter 17 in this book, this online book that I have. And so that's, um, so the, 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 you go to the class web page, and somewhere there is a link to the, to the book, and then you go to chapter 17. I noticed, by the way, this afternoon that there were probably 30 things that I want to change in this, so if you're going to print it out, I, I wait. Wait a day. Okay. Now, of course, one of the work forces of quantum mechanics is that the identity operator is an integral p prime, p prime, 
DP prime over, no, no over. This is actually um, right. And Q double prime, P prime is 1 over root 2 pi E to the I, Q double prime, P prime. And um, so now we're going to use one of these Gaussian integral formulas to uh, compute the following. And namely, Q double prime e to the minus epsilon h Q prime. And we're going to insert a complete set of states. So we have Q double prime minus infinity plus infinity. We're going to use this expression here. So we have e to the minus epsilon p squared over 2m. Uh, P prime, P prime, E to the minus epsilon V of Q, Q prime, P, P prime. So we've just inserted, we just use this expression for E to the, this approximation, and then we've inserted the identity operator in here, and uh, now we just use the rules of quantum mechanics to evaluate this. This is the easy part. It's funny, this is the hard part of the uh, problem because V could be nonlinear, but Q prime is an eigenstate of Q, and so bingo, we get out in front e to the minus epsilon V of Q prime. And uh, what's left then is P prime Q prime, which is the complex conjugate of this, so this is 1 over root 2 pi e to the minus I Q prime P prime. So we've got all of this done. And now, this is an eigenstate of that. So this is minus epsilon P prime squared over 2m. And now we have this inner product, which is by this formula, 1 over square root of 2 prime e uh, to the i q double prime P prime. Because I've said H prime. C is equal to one, the dollar is equal to the euro, and so forth. <laughs> it would be amusing to make such transformations when you have to be head of the Federal Reserve to do that. Uh, oh, and I, of course, left out the integral. We have an integration dp prime. Okay, well you combine the two pi's and um, what you get using this integral form, using one of these integral formulas is you get that this is equal to a factor out in front m over 2 pi epsilon to the 1 half e to the minus m over 2 q double prime minus q prime squared over epsilon and then minus epsilon v of q prime. So that's, that's what we've got. And the thing is exact and the limit epsilon goes to 0. Is anybody hungry? You only have to ask a simple question. So you, you recover a delta function? You should get a delta function, right? Because Q double prime and Q prime should be in the limit that epsilon goes to zero. Good. Yes. You should. <clears throat> um, maybe, uh, and um, well, you can see that sort of happening because mm -hmm. epsilon, if epsilon is zero and Q prime, these things differ then this thing is essentially Zippo. On the other hand, if Q double prime equals Q prime and you send epsilon to zero, um, this thing goes to one, the coefficient in front goes to infinity. All right, so now what we do is, is something cute. We just introduce a notational change. We're going to say that Q dot prime is 
q double prime minus q prime over epsilon. Um, this is actually a Euclidean time, but the idea is that um, the difference between two q's divided by the very small epsilon, this can be thought of as a, uh, as a, 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 a speed at which q prime is changing. And if you do that, then you get a nice formula here that's very suggestive. By the way, this path integrals are always ascribed to Feynman because he did so much with them. But I think it was Dirac who first uh, broke them down. And it's really amazing that that guy did so many different things. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, amazing. Anyway, m over 2 pi epsilon to the 1 half e to the minus a half m q dot prime squared plus v of q prime. And all of this is times epsilon. And let, let me just mention what we're going to be doing. We're going to be changing. We're going to be starting out with q prime, q double prime, q triple prime, and so forth, and then n different time slices for q, beta time slices. And um, so this prime means the deriv time derivative at time prime, basically. Okay. Anyway, it will become apparent in a minute. Okay, well, the next step, of course, is so far we just have e to the minus epsilon h. We want uh, to, in fact, be considering the case e to the minus beta h. And if we're interested in the ground state, we want beta to go to infinity. So we have a long way to go here. Since we're in the limit epsilon going to zero, we want the limit epsilon going to infinity. So that's a huge transformation. Um, but if you're direct, no problem. Okay, so what we do is we just put two of these things together, e to the minus 2 epsilon h, and I'll put an extra prime here. Q prime. The primes are just to indicate that we're talking about q, uh, an eigenvalue, rather than q, an operator. And then we add primes obviously to distinguish one value, one eigenvalue from another. Well, this, we can, we can put these things together by using another version of the uh, identity operator, namely it's equal to an integral uh, q prime, q prime, d q prime. And, um, and so, what we do using this twice is we get m over 2 pi epsilon, which should have been out in front, but anyway, e to the minus a uh, big bracket here, a half m q dot double prime squared plus v of q double prime plus a half m q prime dot squared um, plus d of q prime, all that times epsilon, and then dq double prime. All right, so that's just sticking the two of them together. Putting, uh, in other words, this what I've written here is q triple prime e to the minus epsilon h double prime, Q double prime, e to the minus epsilon h, Q prime, dq, double prime, minus infinity plus infinity. That's what this is. So what we do with the, the p squared in our Hamiltonian? Oh, we've, we've done the following. The p squared goes away. It becomes this dot squared. 
In other words, Q double prime e to the minus epsilon h q prime is a factor, and then this exponential. Oh, I see. We know what these two are. Yeah, yeah. Do you want more candy? Or you saturate. Okay. I gave one more away. Well, do you want to another? Do you want no, to give another one away? No. Okay. So that's what we got. And notice what happens. It's a very simple form. We added an extra epsilon here. We got an extra overall factor of the square root. We had to integrate over something, the q double prime. But we, we've got an exponential with two of these things. All right. And notice that this q dot double prime involves, is, is, is really q triple y prime minus q double prime over epsilon. Maybe I should just write that down. Q double prime dot is Q triple prime minus Q double prime over S. So it's the time derivative basically at Q double prime. All right, well, we'll do one more. We'll put three of them together, and now I'm going to use numerical subscripts. So Q sub 3, E to the minus 3 epsilon H, Q 0. And I'm a little puzzled as to why it's Q0, but anyway. Um, integral Q3 e to the minus, whoops, epsilon h, Q2, Q2 e to the minus epsilon h, Q1, Q1 e to the minus epsilon h, Zero, and now this is eq1, eq2. Well, that's certainly true. That's in fact an exact relation. All right. Now, what we do though is we now use our formula here, this formula, for these three factors, and what we get is that this is m over 2 pi epsilon to the 3 halves integral e to the minus, and now this is epsilon sum i equals 0 to 2, 1 half m q sub i dot squared plus v of q i. It's all in the exponential, dq1, dq2. So is everybody happy with this? The next step is to say, well, we can go from 3 to n. And so now we have q sub n, e to the minus n epsilon h, q0. Now we have, just aping this formula, we have m over 2 pi epsilon n over 2 integral e to the minus epsilon and a sum i equals 0 to n minus 1, a half m q sub i dot squared plus b of q sub i and then product dq i, i equals of 1 to n minus 1. All right, so that's, this is not a minus sign, this is just a two. Okay. Now you can see that this, this actually has a very nice form here. Because you see, if you imagine a um, particle that goes from Q0 to Q1, then maybe to Q2 here, and then up here to Q3, Q4, and then 
whatever up to Qn here during these time slices, each a slice of epsilon. So these are time slices. For some reason, I don't know why I'm going backwards. Um, uh, the idea, though, is time is going forward. And so we're, this particle then is following a trajectory. And we're supposed to integrate over all trajectories. They all start at the same point and end at a particular q sub n because we've got these eigenvalues, q0 and qn. But in between, they can do absolutely anything. So that's, um, that's this, this very puzzling thing. And I, it, it would be really wonderful if uh, some genius would um, analyze these functional integrals and do what Newton and Leibniz did um, to calculus but do it for functional integration. It would be just a dramatic change in, um, in mathematics and also in physics. Um, but we're still waiting. OK, so this, this so, so you see that this is essentially uh, basically the energy. This is the kinetic energy, this is the potential energy, this is the energy uh, integrated, or it's basically the average energy over the time interval uh, in epsilon. And um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the following. I'm going to say the, we have to let epsilon go to zero. We have to let n epsilon go to beta, which is all over, say, kt, if we're doing this that way. And um, notice then that n is equal to beta over epsilon. So this, this n is really going to infinity like nobody's business. And um, moreover, epsilon is going to 0. So this is essentially an arbitrary to large number raised to an arbitrary to large power. That's huge. Okay. That multiplies this thing over here, um, which is just a zillion products of a positive exponential, well, with a minus epsilon in it and a product of an infinite number of those exponentials. So that's kind of a zero. And um, especially since we're supposed to integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, so these, this integrand, this thing here can get very, very long. So that's, that's basically what it is. And you eventually arrive at this formula. Q sub beta, e to the minus of beta h, q zero, is now, we felicitous, we happily uh, write the, write the um, overall factor, which is an embarrassing factor because it has epsilon in it in two places there. And then we have E minus integral, zero to beta, one half m, now a real q dot squared of t plus v of q of t dt. And now we integrate basically over all possible paths. And we've got this arbitrary butter type here. Okay. Now, my suspicion is that when, <coughs> that if well, my view is that, in fact, the only thing that makes sense for path is ratios of path because this thing is clearly going, uh, going to 
infinity in a crazy way. So what you can do, you see, is you can do something like this. You can say that, so I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but an important tangent. Let's, um, let's look at this case, where what we, did, what we had in here was n factors of um, qi plus 1 e to the minus beta h qi. There are n factors in there. In one of the factors, we can insert a Q, say QK. Okay. So I'm, I'm, this is, so it's not to spoil the equation, we can say this is, um, this would have the Q somewhere inserted sort of in the middle of this, in the right place in these n factors of e to the minus epsilon h. And so what you could have then is something like this. Q beta, Q to the minus beta H, um, uh, well, it's an operator. So we have, have it a Q here. Well, I'm really going all the reservation here. Suppose Q to the minus beta 2, let's put it in the middle. Let's just do this then that would be this n integral e to the minus integral 0 to beta, blah, blah, blah. And now this would be q of beta over 2, any q. And we have here um, this same bracket, d2. Now what you can do is you can take the ratio of this to q beta e to the minus beta h q0. And now you see this is an integral e to the minus 0 to beta dt dq. Now we've got something that makes mathematical sense because these guys cancel. So in other words, what we can call this is the, the value of q. And in fact, if we want to go to the trace, we just said q beta equal to q0 integrate over q beta in the numerator and the denominator. That don't mean you'll have an extra integration on top and bottom. But in other words, what makes sense is ratios of path integrals. <clears throat> These ratios make sense. Anything that's crazy, like the ends, cancel. And this limiting process of the dqs cancels if you, in ratios. And so this makes perfect sense. And in fact, when you're doing, if you wanted to do this on a computer, then approximate this thing so you'd have this, you, you, you wouldn't have an infinite number of slices, you'd have n slices, however many you could afford on your computer. Then, um, uh, in fact, if you then applied a Monte Carlo technique to do this ratio, um, what you would be doing is you'd be just generating configurations and then you just take an average of q of beta of 2, beta over 2, uh, as the Monte Carlo program staggered through this. Uh, anyway, we can talk about Monte Carlo later. But. All right, anyway, so back, back to the sequential development. We have uh, this expression. And so this is our, our path integral formula. And if we switch from well, one variable to uh, three-dimensional vector, which is look like this, we have a vector here, and this will be a vector. So that's, that's how that works. Uh, any questions? All right, well, the next thing is you just change uh, epsilon to, um, I epsilon basically, and just repeat the whole um, derivation. And um, first of all, let me do the, the, the very simplest case, namely double prime e to the minus I epsilon H. And this through this p squared over 2. And we make this approximation again. We insert the p primes. So we have 
have this expression. We then, uh, this thing then is an eigenstate, this operator, it pops out over here. Uh, we know what P prime, Q prime is, and Q prime, P prime. This is an eigenstate of that. And so um, what we get is that this is 1 over 2 pi uh, e to the minus i epsilon v of Q prime. And then we have this integral e to the minus i epsilon Q prime squared over 2m plus i P prime times Q double prime minus Q prime d P prime. This is a Gaussian integral that we can do by one of those formulas over there. And um, what we get is m over 2 pi i epsilon to the 1 half e to the i epsilon times m e prime dot squared over 2 uh, minus v of q prime. So there's a minus sign that occurs there. And the minus sign just comes from this minus sign here. So that's, that's that. And now we just do the same thing. In other words, we do two of them, inserting a complete set of two states. We then do three of them. We then go from three to n. And we get then the following expression. Um, Q sub t, e to the minus i t h, Q zero. It's a different n. Maybe I should put a prime on it. But anyway, it's e to the i integral 0 to t. But now this is 1 half m q sub i dot squared, and maybe I'll make it explicit, of t minus v of q of t dt dq. dq meaning you integrate over all paths. Now this is real time in this case. And um, this is, in fact, just the action of the particle. This is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, so it's the action. So this formula has a very nice form. Uh, integral e to the i s dq. And this s is the action functional. So one often writes it as a square bracket, like that. So we have we, we consider all trajectories then from q zero to q t in time t, and um, we compute the action of that trajectory. We take e to the i s, functionally integrate over all of them, we multiply by some number from hell, and um, that gives us our expression. But if we did ratios of, of, of these amplitudes, everything would be fine because the numbers from hell would cancel. The other thing that cancels, by the way, is there's, there's some uncertainty or ambiguity in what you mean by dq. You know, it's easy for me to say integrate overall functions. But you know the number of functions is what is it the third degree of infinity? I mean you have the integers, then you have the irrational number, the number of real numbers, and then I think the number of functions is the next that the next order of infinity, Cantor's orders of infinity. So this is um, L of two. I think. Um, so there's, there's, there's some ambiguity there, but when you take a ratio, whatever your definition is here cancels. Okay, so, so, and of course you can go to three dimensions, and this is just your... your <coughs> Like that. 
So how did it happen that we got the minus sign to get the action that we didn't have before? I miss, well, I miss how they're different. Okay, it's, 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 I almost feel like, how do you, ask not where we got the minus sign. Ask rather where we got the plus sign. Sure. The guy who uh, wrote those, uh, those sentences, ask not what your country can do with you. You died just a couple of days ago. Yeah, you ate to Ted Sons. Anyway, um, to answer your question, this minus sign was always there. It's the trivial minus sign. And it's just um, from e to the minus i epsilon h. The h has a v in it, so you get an e to the minus i epsilon v. So that minus sign is, is the obvious one. The, the puzzling one is this one. And this comes just from this equation here. When you do this integration over p prime, just happen to get a plus. Uh, okay. That comes from completing the square, probably, and the fact that I was. Absolutely, the absolutely. That's <coughs> exactly the right answer, yes. Thank you. Right. Do you need any candy to give away? That's the moment. Does anybody else have a question, or has anyone else asked a question and not gotten in trouble? Was that you? No, no, no. <laughs> All right, you, you know, this is a um, confusing subject. I mean, I'm lecturing on it, and I've written on it, but that doesn't mean that uh, I find it clear. Um, it's, it's, it's intrinsically mysterious, which I think makes it interesting. For me, anything that I understand is immediately boring. Um, whereas, uh, this stuff is not boring because it's so puzzling. Okay, well let's just let's let's do the following. Let's put in uh, h bar. Then what we've got is q sub t p to the minus i t h over h bar q zero. And now this is some n e to the i s of q over h bar d q. Okay, so we're going to ask ourselves, when is, this, when is this functional integral big, when is it small? And what you can tell is that as you vary the Q's, in general, the S changes a lot. And so you get, because of this I, things get washed out like gangbusters. On the other hand, if you choose, a, if, if you have a classical, if one of your Q's is a classical path that keeps the action stationary, then, in other words, if S of QC plus Q prime, prime meaning different now, is S of QC plus, um, and the first term vanishes, Uh, and, and so it's instead something like QC, Q prime minus QC squared over two, say, um, times some S double prime of QC. In other words, if the first order term vanishes, then, and, and so I, I'm, I'm sort of writing nonsense here. You know what? You understand what I mean? Uh, I, w I was going to, by the way, I was I was going to do a a pre lecture on functional derivatives, and do in particular the functional Taylor series. Um, let me just write down the functional Taylor series. So you're just saying the first functional derivative vanishes, which is just the statement right, that right, right, right. see is this. There's nothing wrong with the, the term that I left out, because it's not there. Um, and it's not supposed to be there. But um, all right, let me just write down this thing. I mean, this is clearly just the Taylor series where we've replaced right, right, right. So parentheses let me just, with here. Here, here. Well, this right. is, if, if you, the, the chapter 16 is on 
the following. S of Q plus the sum. This is the case when the action is, when Q is stationary. It's a sum N equals 2 to infinity, 1 over N factorial. And now I'm writing it actually in language that actually makes sense. So this is a functional Taylor series. Uh, so H is an arbitrary function that we add to Q, the function Q. So H is playing the role of Q prime. So in other words, this, all right, let, me, let me just redo it. Then. Q classical, Q prime, Q classical, Q classical plus Epsilon Q prime. Right. I think that's right. <clears throat> so it doesn't have to be some notion of Q prime being a small deviation from the classical stationary path? Or no? No, I think I think this makes sense. Ah, the smallness comes from the epsilon. <clears throat> Um, I, I asked the class before, well, there were a few people here, and I asked some of them, did I talk about functional derivatives already in this course, and I was told that I had. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I skipped that pre-lecture. Anyway, it's chapter 16, you can read about it. Uh, you get this expression here. It seems to me that one actually might make serious use of this and, and try to go all right, let's make use of it, though, for the case in which um, the, the action is quadratic. Well, for the action being quadratic, if you have a classical path, then this series terminates because you don't have any higher derivatives, any derivative that's higher than 2. So this is just 1 half d2 d epsilon squared of S of QC plus epsilon Q prime, epsilon equals zero. So that's what that turns out to be. And in any event, notice that whether it's classical, whether whether it's whether the action is quadratic, in which case you get this, or the action is general, in which case you get this. Um, nonetheless, because this is a classical path, so that the first, the n equals 1 term vanishes, um, there are zillions, in fact, out of two different cubes that are arbitrarily close to Q classical. They all come in with only this small deviation something that's in second order in the, in the difference. And um, so the result is that these phase factors are all the same. It's you know, e to the i 39 or something. And then you know, e to the i 39.01, e to the i 39.02, and so forth. And all of those factors come in out of two times. And so we get, wow. Zoom. For a classical trajectory, this thing is huge. If you don't have a classical trajectory, then these things, these, these things of e to the i 39, the next one is e to the i 47, the next one is e to the i minus 30 times 300, and so forth. And so they basically cancel and wash out. So what that means is that this amplitude is big when there's a classical path that goes from Q0 to QT. And um, in fact, we'll see in a minute that when that's the case, uh, the answer is to lowest order e to the i s of Q classical divided by h bar plus corrections. So let's, let's look at a particular case of this thing. Let's look at the, the really the simplest case 
possible where the thing is quadratic. And this is, this is just the case of a free particle, in fact, a free particle in three dimensions. So now we'll have q sub t e to the minus i t h q zero. This is then some n integral e to the i zero t one half m q dot squared dt dq. So that's the integral we have to do. And now, indeed, there's always a classical path non-relativistically. The classical path is just the classical of t is equal to q0 plus q of t minus q0 over t. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, what a typo. So we're going to uh, apply this. We're going to compute the path uh, integral for a free classical particle. And the point is that non-relativistically, this is the non-relativistic uh, <coughs> action here. Non-relativistically, there's always a classical path that in time t goes from q0 to qt. And this is the classical path. Um, wait a minute, what did I do here? Ah, uh, that's why there's a type. We've got two different, I'm using T for two different things. Um, let me use, let me use big T here. I didn't use big T because I didn't want a confusion with the temperature. So now Q of T. All right, now it looks better. Sorry. That's why there were some puzzled expressions because what I wrote down, I corrected the typo, but what I did in my, in my notes here is I have t over t. And I was thinking in my head, one t is the whole interval, the other t is the particular time. I once was taking a course in abstract algebra in college. I think I may have told you guys this. I, used, I proved something correctly, but I used a, the letter A for three different things. <laughs> I got zero on that. I tried to explain to the professor what I was doing, but he was none of it. Um, excuse me. He was, um, he was a good mathematician. Did I tell you about him? He was a terrible teacher, though. Because what he would do is he would write here. <laughs> he mumbled with a Scotch accent. Oh, it was awful. Anyway. Okay, so this is our expression. Obviously, when t is equal to zero, you're at q zero. When t is equal to capital T, the q zeros cancel, and you get this. So we've got the right. We've got a classical. Notice I say non-relativistically, there's always such a path because relativistically. If q of t was far from q of zero and big T was small, you'd have a velocity that was higher than the speed of light. Okay. All right, in other words, if, if q and t and q and z, if q and big T and q of zero were um, space like, then this thing would be, uh, this should be big T. Okay, so sorry about all this. Um, so let us write our, our process Q of T be Q classical of T plus Q prime of T. Now what is true of Q prime of T? Well, Q prime of zero is zero, but that's also Q prime of big T because we want this process Q of T to go from Q0 to Q sub t as uh, t goes from 0 to big T. And uh, so, so this Q prime then is a loop. So this is a loop. And um, 
if we write then an integral of, um, say, just write this action out, it's m over 2, and it's 2 classical of t plus 2 prime of t dot squared dt. This is the action. It's not really a loop, right? I mean, that's just another path. If you combine both of them, then I guess. No, it's a loop in the sense that q <coughs> prime goes from 0 to 0. OK. But I mean, in, like, in q space, it's not going to be a loop or something. Yeah. It, q prime of 0 and I 0. I see, yeah. But that's a, that was an important question that you asked because, all right. In other words, the, the, here, q zero, q sub t, classical path, straight line. This other path is arbitrary. And, um, okay, so now we compute this. So this is m over 2 integral to classical dot squared of t plus 2 to classical dot of t dot to prime dot of t plus to prime dot squared dt. Okay. Well, this gives the classical action. And this term here is 0 because the, well, it's easy to see that just, it's easier to see that it's 0 than why it's 0. It's 0 because this is a classical path. And in particular, this thing is 2 over big T a number, just a vector that's constant. So that's what Q classical dot is. And that's dotted into Q dot of T, Q prime dot dt integrated. This is the cross term. Okay? But now when you integrate that thing, this is just the time integral of a time derivative. So the total integral here is just dotted into Q prime of t minus Q prime of 0. But this is 0 because it's a loop. So the thing is stationary, and this, as you know, is equal to S of Q classical plus S of Q prime, Q prime being a loop. So now this is true of a very this is true very very generally. Suppose f was simply a quadratic action, in which, in other words, it's q dot squared plus v of q, where v of q is a quadratic. In that case, this would be an exact expression uh, if this was a classical path. We still get this. This follows from this functional Taylor series. All right. So, so now we have um, the following result. Q sub t e to the minus i big T Q zero is well it's N e to the i S Q classical times an integral e to the i s of q prime dq prime. Because we can go from dq to dq prime because, well, it's just a translation in function space, half space. Okay. Now, what is this? This, you see, is all paths that go from 0 to 0. in time big T. So this, and, and it's a number, in fact, what we can do to make things 
a little nicer, is we can take this end here and put it over there. And so we can say this whole thing is just clearly a number, and it only depends upon t because there isn't any q0 or, or q sub t involved. So that tells us that this is equal to e to the i s of q classical times some function of t. In my notes, for some reason, I brought along the n, so I'll bring along the n. Obviously, that n is also a function of t. Um, this is big T? Good. Big T. My, my notes are typo city, really. Um, it's terrible. All right. Now, what is this classical action, S0 of Q classical? Well, it's simply the integral of M over 2, Q sub T minus Q sub 0, divided by T squared dt. And that is altogether M over 2, Q sub T minus Q sub 0, squared divided by big T. So that means that this thing is n f of big T e e i m over 2 q sub t minus q sub 0 squared divided by big T. OK, now what we want is this to go to delta q of q sub t minus q sub 0 as big T goes to 0. And it turns out that, once again, guess who comes to the rescue? P.A.M. Dirac, because one of his formulas for the delta function is that this is equal to the limit big T goes to 0 of m over 2 pi i big T to the 3 halves e to the i m over 2 q sub t minus q sub 0 squared over big T. So that tells us what this structure is. It's just this thing here. In other words, our formula is q sub t e to the minus i big T h q 0 is m over 2 pi i h bar big T, putting in si units, e to the i m over 2 q sub t minus q sub 0 squared over 2 h bar big T. All right, so in other words, the path integral gets us to this expression where this n is where, the, where both, the, both the n and the dq are defined by some limiting process that I don't think anybody really understands. But um, knowing that this has to satisfy this boundary condition as t goes to 0, knowing what this is, comparing the two, we in fact get an exact expression. So what this, I hope, shows you is that the panhandle approach does make sense, um, including the case that is mathematically less um, well-defined. In fact, I've had many discussions in which people would say, well, all right, I can believe this, that you can write this as a path integral, you can never write that as a path integral. But in fact, you see, when you do do that, what you get is n f of t times the right expression. And then the question is, what is that? And, and, and the rule then is that n f of t is just simply m over 2 pi i of t three halves or Put it in h bar. Um, 
So as a way to check to find the, the propagator um, using the Schrodinger equation, compare it to this. Well, sir, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by propagator. If you mean this thing is the propagator, then you can certainly use the Schrodinger equation to figure out what this is. Mm -hmm. And then you can compare it to what we got from the path integral. And they should presumably be the same. Right. But, um, right, you, if, you, if you do do, uh, in fact, if you do use the Schrodinger equation, you can see that this is the right answer because it's basically what? Minus h bar squared over 2m Laplacian on this thing is um, equal to e. And um, when you do Laplacian on this, you get, um, well, anyway, it works. We're over time. So, so we just did this for a uh, for a single particle, right. and, but the I mean we didn't really make any assumptions about the Hamiltonian, so oh. we could we could start with a free particle. We said it was a free particle. Well, we, we said, said free we, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We said we said here that it was a free <coughs> particle, and then the other thing was that we could we could have done something very much similar to this had we said that S was quadratic. Right. Now what's interesting, it, to, what occurred to me this afternoon actually is, could we use that functional power series there for cases in which say F is, S is cubic or quartic? So in other words, and by that I mean you keep, you say S is Q dot squared plus V of Q and V is a function that's at most say quartic. So then you'd have one or two terms in addition there and I don't know, you might just be able to, to do it. I don't, uh, it'd certainly be nice to have some. Uh, I mean, do you, do you need this functional derivative to do that? Couldn't you just stick in the QC Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what you can, I, I was just writing that down generally. What you can do is you just take S and, um, S plus that, and you just expand it and see what you get. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And you can see that once you're dealing with the action, as you go from a single classical particle, monolithic particle, to in fact a, uh, a field theory, um, well, uh, to let the cat out of the bag, what you get is just a classical action of a classical field theory, at least for bosonic. Fermionic fields, you put in something with grasp so, Okay, so that's enough. Let's see, is, is there somebody else who's short of a piece of chocolate? Uh, David Weston.